All news requires a little bit of context, so today we want to talk about vaccine patent waiver in detail. Because we see the headlines, the U.S. said they would waive intellectual property rights on COVID vaccines, the European Commission said they'd follow suit, only to have Germany object, which brought the question of why. And what exactly is a vaccine patent waiver? What does it promise to do? And what obstacles remain in the way of more equitable production and distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine? So for GMS Focus, we have the host of weekly NK News podcast and public relations consultant at Insight Communications, Jacko Zwetzlu, joining us on the line. Good morning, Jacko. Good morning, Lena. It's good of you to join us on a Monday morning again. Thank you. It's nice to be back. All right, Jacko. For all clarifications, could you start by sketching out for us how intellectual property rules work in the pharmaceutical industry? Sure. Uh, basically, it costs pharmaceutical companies a lot of time and money to research and develop a new drug or new vaccine. For example, money spent on testing a drug that never goes into circulation because it is unsafe or not efficacious. And to, in order to recoup those R&D costs, companies want to sell their drugs on the market at the highest possible price and make sure that nobody else can make the same kind of medicine and sell it at a cheaper price, thereby undercutting the original producer. And that's what the patent system does. Mm. Cheaper copies of the drugs uh, made by other companies are called generic drugs because mm. they're not associated with or sold under a big brand pharmaceutical name. Mm. And that gives the uh, inventor of a medicine 20 years in which it can exclusively make, use, and sell that patented product. Only after that period of 20 years can other companies that didn't invent the drug create these generic copies. And that's mm-hmm. true for both medicines and vaccines. Okay, so that sounds like fair on the surface of things. But what's wrong with it in practice? In practice, it means that only those people or those nations that can avoid the high prices can get the access to that drug or that vaccine. And that's why we saw South Africa and India, two poorer countries with large populations, put forward a proposal seven months ago in October 2020 asking to temporarily lift certain intellectual property rights that belong to pharmaceutical companies so that other nations can develop generic versions of those drugs. Mm -hmm. And the problem that we have globally is a short supply of vaccines and a difficulty in poorer countries getting close enough to the front of the waiting line to get the supply they need for their people. But it does come with the criticism. If the government intervenes too much with the process that a lot of these pharmaceutical companies have held on to and waive intellectual property rights, would it also discourage them from doing more research and development in the future, right? That's... That is an argument often raised, that's right. Right, that's one of the, I think, long-standing criticisms. So let's take a look at who is in favor of waiving these vaccine patents. Yes, it surprised a lot of people that the United States, usually seen to be the protector of uh, intellectual property rights and Mm -hmm. big pharma businesses, uh, has now, under President Joe Biden, come out in support of this proposal of uh, waiving or lifting some intellectual property rights for a limited amount of time. Uh, And the argument that they're making is that during this pandemic, you know, we're all in this together around the world and we should not be thinking about profits, but about survival of as many humans as possible. And therefore, we should allow other manufacturers to make cheap generic copies of the vaccines to Mm -hmm. circulate in less wealthy countries. But I think you put in a lot of key words. Some intellectual property rights wait for a limited amount of time, right? Yes, exactly. It's not like uh, it's not like President Joe Biden is suddenly saying, "Okay, guys, no more patents anymore uh, on drugs. I mean, that would certainly be uh, the end of uh, medical innovation as we know it in the pharmaceutical industry. I imagine the World Health Organization is largely in favor of this move led by the United States. Yes, it sure is. Uh, WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyes uh, uh, mm-hmm. described it in Twitter as a powerful example of leadership to address global health challenges. Uh, also, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres welcomes the unprecedented support from the U.S. in a statement issued on Thursday morning via his spokesperson. And that statement went on to say, it opens the opportunity for vaccine producers to share the knowledge and technology that will allow the effective expansion of locally produced vaccines that can significantly increase the supply to the COVAX facility. And remember Mm -hmm. that COVAX is an initiative that aims to ensure that as many people in the world, especially in those poorer nations, uh, can get access to vaccines as possible. 
and also the World Trade Organization uh, is in favor of a limited waiver for the vaccines too. Which was initially kind of unexpected, WHO, yes, but also the WTO, um, Mm. because when the United States made the announcement that they would look into waiving some of these stand-in patents on vaccine, the U.S. Trade Minister, Catherine Tai, did say that it would be a long process and they need need the... uh, help of the World Trade Organization, which brings us to our next question. Is a waiver just something that would happen in the United States? Because, well, doesn't every country have its own national patent systems? Yeah, it does. But uh, the World Trade Organization is in charge of administering a multilateral agreement on patents called the Agreement on Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights. So it's known as the TRIPS Agreement for short. And this agreement came into being in 1995 precisely as a response to growing competition from generic drug industries in poorer countries. So the argument is that a temporary and limited TRIPS waiver Mm. could open the way globally for generic manufacturers to make more and cheaper uh, vaccinations. Now, it's interesting to note that there's some evidence to suggest that some people saw a risk back in 1995 when this agreement was signed. Uh, American Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz wrote in his 2006 book, Making Globalization Work, quote, We worried that when the TRIPS agreement was signed, we were simultaneously signing the death warrant for thousands of those in developing countries who would be deprived of life-saving drugs. Mm -hmm. Our worries turned out to be real. Now, he was writing well before COVID, but we're certainly seeing that that effect in having the same kind of uh, uh, negative consequence here in this time. All right, which brings us to the core of this discussion. Will a partial patent waiver mean a quick fix to problem of lack of supply and global vaccination? Because we also bring up questions around infrastructure and production capability for one. Yeah, that is a, a great question. The problem would not be solved overnight, even if everyone were to agree to the waiver today. Setting up the complex production process is not easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, many generic producers would need the cooperation from original manufacturers, mm-hmm. such as Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, Moderna, etc., uh, in order to be able to achieve their own production, uh, to set up their own production lines. Some people hope that even the threat of a patent waiver without actually having to put it into place, would encourage more big pharma producers to enter into voluntary licensing agreements in order to transfer their know-how uh, at minimal or no cost to generic producers. Mm-hmm. But even under those circumstances, it could be up to six months to uh, ramp up to full-scale production. So who is actually opposed to the waiver at this stage? Yeah, last week, uh, when I checked, it was the um, both the European Union and Switzerland were not yet fully in favor. The European Union had sent some signals, but it seemed like they were sitting on the fence. It said that they were uh, in favor of talks Mm -hmm. about a waiver. Uh, As you mentioned earlier, the German government specifically uh, did come out in opposition. Uh, It released a statement late last week saying, the protection of intellectual property is a source of innovation and must remain so in the future. That's the standard line. Mm -hmm. Uh, The German government also argued that the biggest problem related to holding back the production of the vaccine is not patent related, but it's a matter of capacity and quality. Mm. Right? So going back to the factories and, and the manufacturers. Uh, Germany also re- reiterated its support for the COVAX initiative. Uh, and of course, apart from national interests, of course, the big pharma industry is worried globally about the loss of intellectual property rights across the board, as well as profits from the sale of vaccines. And what we can't just disregard is that these are private companies that need to make money from the years of research and development they poured into. I mean, what our listeners, if they've been tuning in every day, are aware of is that these mRNA technology didn't just happen overnight, right? So what kind of money are we talking about here? Just to take one company as an example, Pfizer uh, recently forecast vaccine revenues of $26 billion this year Mm. with profits around $7 billion. Mm. Now, they argue that splitting that money or foregoing it completely in the case of a patent waiver takes away some of the incentive to to invest in research and innovation. Uh, But as I understand it, As I said earlier, that waiver that's being discussed is only supposed to be a limited waiver for vaccines and COVID-19 related drugs, not a waiver for everything, Mm -hmm. nor a dismantlement of the WTO's TRIP system for all time. I think that most policymakers understand that a full across the board unlimited waiver could really take the wind out of the sails uh, of research and development in the pharma industry. 
Uh, under President Trump, but weren't there also government moves to help medicine manufacturers avoid some of the financial costs and risks associated with innovation? Yeah, that's a, a, an interesting point that we shouldn't forget. Uh, Operation Warp Speed was mm-hmm. President Trump's administration's plan to speed up the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, not only speed up, but also streamline it. Uh, his Department of Health and Human Services helped to build out the necessary infrastructure and also guaranteed the manufacturing of successful vaccines. Vaccines. They even went to the extent of buying allocations of vaccines before they knew which ones would work. Mm. And, and these decisions, you know, the sum total of all of them, uh, was described as a game changer by taking lowering costs and risks associated with developing uh, a new vaccine. So this latest move by President Biden takes that uh, Operation Warp, st- Warp Speed one step further you know, to help the poorer countries. But, yeah, it's not uh, totally uh, unprecedented, should we say. Another word that keeps popping up as a key word in discussion is vaccine nationalism. Uh, Is this possibly an example of that at work? Yeah, vaccine nationalism is basically taking the attitude of everyone in my country should get vaccinated first before other countries get Mm. it. Uh, And that that can lead to a hoarding of resources so that some countries uh, and areas hold uh, hoard more resources, more vaccines than they actually need, Uh, which is, of course, not a great idea because the result of large populations of unvaccinated and infected people is that new variants of viruses can mutate. Right. Every person Mm. who becomes infected becomes one more opportunity for a new mutation, which could ultimately threaten even people who are vaccinated vaccinated in wealthy countries, right? Because they mm. will, might not be immune to new variants. So this has the potential of prolonging the pandemic. Now, what we are seeing, it, it does look on the surface of it to be uh, an example of vaccine nationalism because countries are taking care of their populations first. Mm. Some analysts argue that the wealthy Uh, diplomatic powers are harming their own reputation by not being faster to share vaccines with the poorer countries, while Russia and China, uh, not normally held up as being beacons of democracy and freedom, they're sending their vaccines out. But Mm. it's all a little bit more complicated than it appears at first sight. Remember Mm. that in a democratic country, politicians are ultimately answerable to the voters who either keep them in power or vote them out of office. And I think that there is some understandable fear in uh, the governments of democratic countries that if they don't put their own people first, that will make voters um, unhappy Mm -hmm. and then they could be voted out of office in their next elections. Even though in the long term, it doesn't benefit everybody uh, if in some parts of the world people are fully vaccinated while in other parts people are not. In the end, thanks to global travel and trade, the virus will find its way back. So you've got basically a mismatch between long term and short term goals. Right. And, and in democratic countries, you have to be much more careful of balancing those out or else if the voters t- turn away, as you've said, they might yep. not have a time in office to make these important decisions. Yeah. All right. As for some countries are left behind, how are Africa and India doing in terms of vaccinations? Uh, well, India is, is the center of the world's biggest wave of infections mm. right now, as we've seen in the news the last couple of weeks. And it's uh, it's really tragic. Uh, it's awful to see how the medical system has collapsed there. You know, the the images that we see on the news night after night are are quite striking Mm -hmm. and uh, disturbing. Uh, Meanwhile, in Africa, COVAX has delivered at least 18 million vaccine doses to 41 African countries. But that is out of a population of over 1.2 billion people. So Mm -hmm. we're talking about, you know, basically 1.5 percent of the overall population of that continent. Uh, And we're also seeing, sadly, uh, some vaccinations, mainly AstraZeneca, being left to go beyond their use by date, partly over fear about safety because of some cases of sudden blood clotting and also partly because South Africa received some doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine but then switched to Johnson & Johnson because it believes that that uh, vaccine has greater efficacy uh, Mm -hmm. perhaps because you only need one dose uh, and not two. So not not great figures from India or Africa right now unfortunately. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, In case some of our listeners missed the entire discussion, here's a big takeaway. As far as vaccine patent waivers go, what's the latest news? Uh, Last week, the EU leaders said that rather than waiving intellectual property rights, it would be faster to make more shots in places that are already making them and then export them to poorer countries. So whatever happens, it looks like it will take a while longer before there are enough vaccinations to cover a sufficient sufficient proportion of the global population to end this COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. And that means, sadly, that many more people will become infected and possibly die, especially in places where the medical infrastructure is unable to treat all those who become seriously ill. 
Thank you for managing our expectations. I think that summarizes it really well. Thanks, Lena. Sorry to give such bad news. No, you just you just state the facts for us. I'll talk to you again next week, Jacko. Thank you, Lena. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.